Uh, let me do an example problem. And um, at the end of this, yes. Okay. Oh, of the vector review. Um, yeah, so you, um, so there are two vectors. Um, so let's say we have the vector. Okay, so what what are the two unit vectors? that are perpendicular to both. Um, I'm just going to make up a couple of vectors. So 2, 0, 1, and uh, negative 4, positive 4, 0. Um, well, to find two vectors that are perpendicular to both of those, take the cross product. and you can, so, uh, a non-unit vector, you know, just a vector that's perpendicular to both. You can get as 2, 0, 1 crossed with negative 4, 4, 0. Um, and that would give you negative four, and then negative four, and then eight. Um, and what would you get if you did the cross product in the other order? Negative four, four, zero crossed with two, zero, one. You, yeah, all the signs would switch. And and so those would be the two those would be two vectors perpendicular to both of those, okay. Um, so four four negative eight is also perpendicular to both. And then take the unit vector. Um, I feel like uh, this is. Like, I, I think this might come out to be a unit vector, like, uh, oh, no, that can't be. Okay, well, so um, the magnitude of this vector is 16 plus 16 plus 64 square root. Um, what is it? Or root six. What's that about? Uh, nine point something. What nine point what? Nine point eight. Okay. Um, and so then the unit vector is one over nine point eight times. The original vector and so you get does this come out to be like 0. 0.408 negative 0. 0.408 negative 0. 0.408 negative 0. 0.8 one six, uh, that's positive. Yes! Take that, Dad. Said I never amount to anything. Um, and so then the other one, so this is the first one, and then the second one is positive 0. 0.408, positive 0. 0.408, negative 0. 0.816, 
And okay, those are the two unit vectors that are perpendicular to both of those original two vectors. Um, and now the next question, this is finally we get to the thing you asked about, which one of those is in the direction of uh, 2, 0, 1 cross negative 4, 4, 0, say? Okay, well, um, this is the one So this one is in the direction of the cross product of these two, and the opposite one is in the direction of this cross this. So it just depends which order you do the cross product. That's what it was asking for. Any other questions about that one? Okay. Any other vector review questions? All right. So let's do an example connected to the stuff we were doing last time. Um, and at the end, we're going to get a big system of equations. And in this class, we're going to get a lot of big systems of equations. And you will not want to solve those by substitution or something. You know, we'll, some we'll get ones as big as 20 equations for 20 variables. You know, you would never want to sit there doing substitution. Even if you did spend the time doing it, what are the chances you do all those operations without messing something up and then everything's haywire? So I'm going to show you a way to do this really fast and easily in a TI calculator. Um, okay, so let's say that there's an incline. Um, and it makes a 30 degree angle with the horizontal. Um, there's a pulley at the corner here. And on the incline, there's one cart here with a mass of one kilogram. And then a little farther down, there's another cart with a mass of three kilograms. And there's a box sitting on top of it with a mass of two kilograms. Um, and the oops, two carts are connected by a cable. And then a different cable goes from the first cart over the pulley, and then it's connected to the ground. And um, there's friction between these two. There has to be if those are going to be in equilibrium. Otherwise, the two kilogram would just slide off. And we want to calculate... The cable tensions and the contact forces. Um, and to do that, we're first going to draw free body diagrams of each of these objects, okay? And then one by one, we're going to go through Newton's second law with each one of those objects. We're going to come up with a bunch of relationships. It'll give us a bunch of equations, and then we'll solve that system of equations. Okay, so a free body diagram for the one kilogram cart. There's the outline. What forces are acting? Yep. So there's a downward force of 9.81 times 1, so 9.81 newtons. And now we're just going around the boundary looking for contact with the outside world. Um, at the wheels, we'll, we'll lump those both into a single force because this is still particle statics. Um, so what kind of force is that that the ground is applying to the wheels? 
yeah, it's a normal force or what I was calling a, a pushing force without friction, a frictionless contact force. Um, and so that force is perpendicular to the surface toward the chosen body. So this way, and yeah, let's call that, um, let's call that N1. And then if we keep going around counterclockwise, we get to the right side, there's a cable force there. And a cable force is parallel to the cable, away from the chosen body, so it has to be this way. And I'll call this cable force T1. And then we get to the other side, and there's another cable force this way, um, and I'll call that T2. And I'm just going to do all the free body diagrams first, and then we'll go to the equations. Now we'll go to the two kilograms. Okay, there's a weight force. That's 2 times 9.81. And the only other place there's contact is the force that is applied to this by the three kilogram. That's a friction contact, which means that it's a fully unknown force vector. <clears throat> Excuse me, it has both components of force. Um, and the naming convention for force vectors, unknown force vectors, is F, and then the subscripts are um, the body it's being applied to, and then the second subscript is the body applying it. So I'm going to call this F um, on two by three. And then we'll go to the third one. Okay, so what forces are acting on the third one? Um, well, there's the weight force. That's 3 times 9.81, so 29.43. Then there's contact with the 2 kilogram cart. That's a friction contact. The naming convention here would be the force on 3 by 2. But we've already named a force, force on two by three. So we'd like to reuse that so we don't increase the number of variables we have to solve for. So this is F32, but remember F32 is negative F23. Okay. And so um, we just went from adding two new variables into our system of equations to keeping the same number that we had before. Uh, and then there's the only other force. Oh, yeah, there's two more forces. So there's a normal force. I'll call that N3. And then there's the cable force. And this is the same cable as that cable T1 from the one kilogram. So I'm going to call this T1 again. Those have to have the same magnitude as long as that cable is, um, uh, is massless. Those always have to be the same. So in this class, cable forces are just always going to be the same anywhere along the length. All right. So um, can we solve this? Is there a way to figure out whether we can solve this? Well, we can figure out how many equations we're going to get. We can figure out how many variables we have. And if we have um, more variables than equations, then there's nothing we can do. Okay. Uh, so let's count this up. We have three variables here. Two more here, an x and a y component. So that's now we're at five, right? And then 
That's not new, that's not new, this one's new. So we have six variables to solve for, okay? So that means we need at least six equations. We could have more and then some just get thrown away, um, but we need at least six, uh, six equations. Um, so for a single body, how many equations are we gonna get? How many Newton's law equations are we gonna get? Yeah, this is a 2D problem. So we'll get X and Y components of Newton's second law for each one of those. So two, four, six, it's gonna be a, six, a system of six equations for six variables. So it looks good. Okay. All right, so um, Newton's second law, So uh, I'll start with body one. Um, well, we need to express these um, as, so these are forces with known directions, right? We know those directions. So we need to come up with the unit vectors defining those directions. So then we just multiply the unit vectors by those variables. Um, so what are these directions? Um, so the incline is 30 degrees. Let me draw a little coordinate system over here and we'll figure out these angles. Um, so first of all, we know that this T2 makes an angle of 30 degrees with the horizontal. And so um, what's the counterclockwise angle? So um, we're going to have T2 times cosine and sine of 150. If you have a way you're comfortable with, you feel better about uh, coming up with those unit vectors, feel free to do that. But this is a way that will always get you the right answer. And you don't have to you know, worry about sines and moving cosines and sines around. And now we'll go to that cable force T1. That also makes a 30 degree angle with the horizontal this way. So what's the angle we want to use for that? 330 or negative 30, either one of those. Oops. So T1 times cosine of 330, sine of 330. Um, and then the weight force is just 0, negative 9.81. And then the last one is that normal force. Um, if you think of that normal force as being perpendicular to this force I have drawn here, That's a 90 degree angle. And so it's gonna be 330 plus 90. So you could use 420 um, or uh, you, could use, you could use 420 if you're looking for a reason to celebrate. Um, or you could use negative 30 plus 90. Uh, and so you get 60. Um, okay, so then that's N1. times cosine of 60, sine of 60. And now we've dealt with all those forces. Those are equal to zero. And so these, this gives us two equations, an X equation and a Y equation. Uh, the first one is, so cosine of 150 is negative 0 0.866 
multiply that by T2. Cosine of 330 is positive 0.866 multiplied by T1. And then uh, plus cosine of 60 is 0.5 and 1 is equal to 0. And the second equation says, um, so which one is this? So positive 0.5 T2 uh, minus 0.5 T1 uh, minus 9.81 and then uh, plus 0.866 and 1 is equal to 0. So those are the first two equations. And now we'll go on to body two. Um, this one's easy. We don't have to worry about unit vectors and stuff. Uh, we just have the weight force in the negative y direction. So zero, negative 19.62. And then that unknown force vector. Um, so that's the force on two by three x and y components. And that adds up, adds up to the zero vector. And so from this, we get our third and fourth equations. So F23X is equal to zero. And um, negative 19.62 plus F23Y is equal to zero. You could solve those now and, you know, or recognize they're already solved, basically, and um, then reduce the number of variables by two, get those equations out of there. I'm just going to keep them as equations and just plug it all in at the end. And then body three. We have T1, that's again at an a, the angle is 150 degrees. So that's so T1 times cosine and sine of 150 degrees. Then we have this vector negative F23. So I'm just going to write that as negative F23x negative F23Y. Then we have the weight force, zero, negative 29.43. And then we have the normal force. Uh, that's the same direction as the other normal force, so that's positive 60. So N3 times cosine and sine of 60 degrees. And that's equal to zeros. And so our fifth equation says negative 0.866 T1 minus F23X plus zero plus 0.5 N3 is equal to zero. And our sixth equation says positive 0.5 T1 minus F23Y minus 29.43 uh, plus 0.866 uh, 
n3 is equal to zero. And that gives us our fifth and sixth equations. Okay, so now we're going to solve this system of equations using reduced row echelon form. So solve this on a TI calculator. using reduced row echelon form. Um, if you have a TI-89 or a TI-Inspire, um, there are uh, special programs in there for solving linear systems of equations like this. So you can still use reduced row echelon form, or you can just figure out how to use the program that's designed for this. Either one is fine. Um, if you can't figure out how to do it, come talk to me. But the way we're going to do it is um, we're going to write out each equation variables in the same order and this is important the constants have to be on the other side of the equation so all the, um, all the variables have to be like on the left side of the equation and the constant has to be on the right side. So with the constant alone on the other side of the equation. Um, and so we have to be consistent about the order of variables. Um, our variables are, so we have T1 and T2, N1 and N3, um, and then F23. And F23 is a vector, so it's made up of two different variables. We have X and Y components. Okay, so I'm going to write out all of these six equations with the variables in that order, uh, and then the constants on the other side. Okay, so let's see. Equation one. Uh, T1s, we have 0.866. T2s, we have negative 0.866. So 0.866 T1 minus 0.866 T2. Um, and then we have 0.5 N1s and everything else is zero. So plus zero for N3, plus zero for uh, F23X, plus zero for F23Y, and there's no constant. You don't have to write in the zeros if you don't want. And now the second equation. Um, negative 0.5 T1s, positive 0.5 T2s, 0.866 N1s. So negative 0.5 T1 plus 0.5 T2. Uh, plus 0.866 N1, and the constant when we move it to the other side is positive 9.81. So that's why it's important that you get it alone on the other side or else your sign is going to be backwards. So here we got zero plus, oh no. Okay, hold on a second. I think it'll restore itself.
Okay. What did we lose? Uh, write out each equation with the variables in the same order with the constants alone on the other side. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it this time. I'm skipping right to the next step. Um, and then step two, um, now that you have them in order, write out a matrix. And this matrix is going to be um, n rows and n plus 1 columns. Um, where each row represents an equation. And each column holds the coefficient of that position's variable. Then we're left with one more column at the end because we're out of variables, and that last column holds the constant. Okay, so I'm going to just write it out as like a big spreadsheet. So it's going to have six rows. And seven columns. The rows are the equations. So this is equation one, two, three, four five, six, and the columns, you can choose whatever order you want. You just have to be consistent about the order. Um, so I'm going to call this one the coefficients for T1, T2, N1, N3, F23X, and F23Y, and then this is the constants. Okay, so equation one. The coefficients should be 0.866 for T1, negative 0.866 for T2, and 0.5 for N1. So positive 0.866, negative 0.866, positive 0.5. These are all zeros, and the constant was zero. And then for the second equation, T1, negative 0.5, T2, positive 0.5, N1, 0 0.866. So negative 0.5, positive 0.5, dang it, uh, positive 0.866. The rest of the variables are have zero coefficients, and this time we have a constant of 9.81. Then equation three, uh, the only non-zero coefficient is F23x, so that's one, and everything else is zero, and the constant is zero.
Um, and then four, we have one F23Y is equal to 19.62. So we have a one here, positive 19.62 as the constant and everything else is zeros. And then the last two equations, um, P1, negative 0.866. Uh, N3.5, um, F23X, negative 1 this time, and the constant is 0. And then the last equation, T1.5, um, N3.866, F23Y, negative 1, And that's all the variables. And then the constant is 29.43. And everything else is zeros. Okay. Enter that matrix into your calculator. This is six by seven, because it's a system of six equations and six variables. And then, uh, find the function R, R, E, F of whatever you call this matrix. <laughs> and it'll give you a matrix back that's the same size and you don't care about very much of this. Um, it's still going to be 6 by 7. Um, the first 6 by 6, the left 6 by 6 matrix here is just going to be 1s on the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else. So that just tells you that the program worked. If you don't have that, then something went wrong. But mainly you just are ignoring that part. Okay, so this you don't care about. What you do care about is the last column. And the last column, if I did this right last time, I don't know because I don't have the answers. Um, can anyone, can I borrow a calculator? Anybody want to punch that in and do it quickly? Okay, so tell me if you got the same thing. Uh, so this is positive 24.53. You get the same thing? Okay. And then uh, negative 4.91. Negative 42. Is that a what did you get? Okay, I like that better because that's a cable tension. Yeah, if you uh, just enter one negative sign in wrong or whatever, it messes up all the answers. So negative uh, positive seventeen what? Okay, that's a problem too. Negative 11. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to fix this. Uh So we know that 
we should get positive values for the tensions and the normal forces because we know that we did the directions correctly for those. Um, um, I got 24, negative 4, negative 42, positive 42, 0, 19.62. Oh, you know what? These are, oh, T1, three. Oh, no, that's not a problem. Okay, body one, do, 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 T2. Okay. Oh, you did? Okay. Oops. This is going to be worth it. Okay, six by seven. Uh, so we got, okay. So it should be positive 0.866, negative 0.866, and then 0 0.5. Uh, negative 0.5, positive 0.5. Positive 0 0.866, 9.81, and then zeros. This is going to be riveting video for the people who watch this class. Um, Yeah, you're right. Except then I'd have to look in it and time it. And uh, okay, I'm feeling better about this now. Yes. Okay. This makes sense. Okay. So uh, we got 20, uh, 24.53. And the second one is 29.43. Uh, then the third one is 8.50. The fourth one is 42.48. The fifth one is zero, and the sixth one is 19.62. Okay, good. Um, and so what does that say? Let's put these back in the free body diagram. Um, Okay, so we got this list of values. How do we know which value represents which thing? Yeah, they go in order. Whatever order you chose, that's the order that they come back in. So T1, T2, N1, N3, F2, 3X, and F2, 3Y. So uh, let's draw the free body diagrams again, this time with the values in there. So free body diagram, 
of the one kilogram part. We have uh, this one was what we called T2, I think, right? Yes. So, um, so we have a force this way of 29.43, a force this way of 24.53, a weight force of 9.81, and a normal force of 8.5. And then body two. That's just the weight force of 19.62. And then um, let me, sorry, I'm going to just move this over. Okay, so we have a force down of 19.62. And then um, if you want to think of it as a horizontal and a vertical component of a force, we have a horizontal one of zeros. So I'll just leave that off. And a vertical force of... Um, The vertical force, oh, 19.62, good. All of these now, you know, if you plug all this stuff back in, it keep going back and forth, but if you plug this back into Newton's second law, um, these would all come out to be zero total force if you did it right, because they're all in equilibrium. And then uh, the free body diagram for body three, Um, so we have T1 pulling this way. That's 24.53. Up here we have, um, this is the force on 3 by 2, which is the negative force on 2 by 3. And so... Um, so now on this one, we want the opposites of these. So we have zero for a horizontal component. For a vertical component, we have negative 19.62. So I'm going to switch the sign, uh, uh, the direction. We have the weight force which is 29.43. And then we have the normal force. That's N3, which is 42.48. And you can imagine if this was an engineering application, I mean, if uh, these things were designed to do some job or whatever, we would use these loads in an analysis to figure out how strong the material has to be, how likely it is to break if you if the values vary by this much or whatever from what we expect. Okay, so this is a really useful analysis. Any questions about that? Okay, so um, for Tuesday, uh, I'm going to give you a bunch of uh, particle statics problems to work on. Um, all right, so that's it for particle statics. Um, and that's a pretty, that's a very complicated particle statics problem. Uh, so next, we're going to go on to rigid bodies.
Um, and what's different in rigid bodies is now we're going to assume that objects do have length dimensions. We're not going to treat everything like it just exists at a single point. And because they have length dimensions, we can also uh, do calculations involving the orientation of objects. So now objects do have uh, length dimensions and orientations. Um, and to think about how that works and the relationship between that and particles, um, think about a sled sitting on like an ice rink. And think about two cases. Um, in one case, you you know go up to it and kick it in the side. Uh, let's say that this is a force of uh, 200 newtons. And in the other case, you go up to it and kick it. At the, front. Uh, the force vector has the same direction and the same magnitude. Okay. If we're treating this as a particle, those motions are identical for what we care about. Um, the center of mass of the sled is gonna accelerate off in the same way no matter which one of these you do, okay? Um, but if you care about orientations, those two loads are different, right? Um, for a particle analysis, these are identical. Um, a rigid body analysis, though, Um, will let you calculate the spin that occurs, the spinning um, occurs in the case on the right. Um, and the new thing that we're going to deal with that lets us do that lets us do calculations involving rotations and orientations are moments. Um, so to do that, um, we introduce the idea of the moment. And people usually just call it a moment, but really I think it's good to keep in mind that a moment is referring to the moment of a specific force about a specific point. And the moment equation. Um, which I usually call the rotational version of Newton's second law. Rotational Newton's second law, because that's the one that has like the exact same form as Newton's second law. It's just that everything is a um, sort of a rotational analog of what's in Newton's second law. Instead of forces, now you put moments. Instead of mass, you put 
mass moment of inertia. Instead of acceleration, you use the angular acceleration. So it's sort of an analogous thing, but for rotations instead of translations. Um, okay. So first I have to introduce this idea of a moment. So moment, and then in your head, go of a force about a point. Um, and the mathematical definition is like this. Uh, if you have any object, that's just supposed to be an arbitrary shape, um, this A, we're going to call the about point. And um, the force that's applied to this, uh, I'll say it's over here, and um, I'm just going to choose a direction, but this is true for, you know, any A, uh, any force. Um, this force I'm going to call the force vector F. And the point where that force is applied, I'm going to call P. Okay, so um, that P, that's referring to the coordinates of the point where the force is applied, which, and you can always treat coordinates as a vector because coordinates are a vector from the origin of your coordinate system to the point that you care about. Okay. Um, so now these three things are defined. Now draw a vector that goes from your about point to this point P. And I'm going to call that rho, the Greek letter rho. Then the moment about A. and this is a vector, by the way, is equal to um, that vector rho crossed with the force vector. Um, Notice that this moment vector, since it's the cross product of rho and f, it has to be perpendicular to both rho and f. And so if you're doing a two-dimensional problem, Um, the moment is always out of the page, out of the plane. So in 2D problems where you're using X and Y, MA um, only has a non-zero Z component. Um, understanding uh, intuitively what a moment does, uh, I think this is the easiest way to think of it, intuit. So think about a bolt that you're trying to undo. With a wrench.
and say that bolt's pretty stuck and it's hard to get it loose. Um, say that you know that you're capable of applying 200 newtons of force on the wrench. Okay. Where would you want to apply it if you turn it? You know from living in the world that it's going to work better if you push down with 200 newtons here than anywhere closer to the bolt. Okay. And you can probably also imagine that if you applied your 200 newtons directly above the center of the bolt, it wouldn't even matter if you could apply a million newtons. You'd rip that bolt off before you ever made it turn. Okay. And so the idea is um, you apply a force, try to use the same color code. Um, so you apply this force F um, at this point P, point the center of the rotation is the center of the bolt. So that's A. Okay. And the row vector is this. Okay. So to get the best possible advantage of your 200 newtons you can apply, you want to apply that force with that row vector as big as possible. And you also want to apply that force in a way that your row vector and F are perpendicular to each other. Okay, Because that's how you maximize a cross product when those two are perpendicular. If you, so no matter how far away you, um, you got your, your point where you applied this force, if you applied it parallel to the row vector, it wouldn't turn. Okay, And all that is just because of that cross product relationship. Um, I recommend, um, uh, writing a table to organize all your loads and stuff. For each rigid body that you isolate. Um, to organize all this stuff. Um, so to organize the row vector, the force vector, the moments. And the way I would set it up is you just need three columns. Um, so row, force, moment. Um, and then when you, uh, so for a single body, there'll be all these different forces acting on it. And they'll each have different row vectors and different forces and produce different moments. Um, for whatever about point you chose, you know, you'll write down your row vector, let's say five, negative two, zero. Let's say your force vector is zero, 1500, zero. You have those there. Um, and then you have these for every force that's applied. Take the cross product and you get uh, uh, zero, zero, 7500. And the nice thing is, once you do this, so for a given body, you could have, you know, any number of loads acting on it. Let's say you have four different loads acting on a body. When you're, when you're done with this, you have a column that lists out all your forces, and those are all the forces that go into Newton's second law. And um, you have this column that gives you all your moments for your given about point, and then you just write those down in the moment equation. It's nice for bookkeeping. Um, uh, 
Okay, let's stop there and we'll do the quiz. And I'll give you some stuff to work on for the weekend.